Okay, well, a bit of a review. Um, in the last session, you may recall <coughs> that we learned, and just one of the questions uh, verifies that the French were the first Germanic tribe to convert to Christianity. <coughs> and we also mentioned last time that some things are going to occur, and uh, we'll finish that here, <coughs> a description of a lot of that. Um, but that kingdom is going to develop into a divine monarchy, um, which will challenge uh, the Byzantine Empire. It will challenge orthodoxy in the person of Charlemagne. But that's a lesson or two ahead. What was happening and what led to this? What, what caused it? Well, there was a concentration on the development of really economics, local economic centers and manners. <clears throat> this is in Gaul. And their purpose was to provide food and clothing and supplies for the populace around that manor and for the army when they came and took <laughs> What do we call this? We call it uh, medieval serfdom. So that's what was happening. And of course, as these uh, manners developed, churches developed in those manners widely, but they were by and large isolated from the Roman papacy. They didn't really have a lot to do with it or didn't really recognize its authority. Um, one of the reasons was that the kings of the Franks would set aside the clerical elections and appoint their own bishops in these churches. And so the churches began acquiring land, consolidating power over the manners and the people, and becoming the centers of life. So while we're talking about all this other stuff, that's kind of what's going on in Gaul. We could also review uh, some developments, a few developments in the 6th century church. Uh, vocal, monophonic, one tone singing became standard. And there was the feeling that that the attendees of the services should offer um, themselves to God through their voice. So there were no instruments because they would not have been pure, purely from from us as individuals. Is there any indication that there were instruments before that used in the church regularly? Some, but not much. But it was standardized that there would not be mm. in, the, in the 6th century. Did, did the ecumenical council did they, are they the ones that decided that? No. I think it was local councils. And then the ecumenical councils then said that that's the way it should be? Because we still don't have anything. I don't know if there's a canon on that or not. Uh, I think there's some canons that deal with it, but sometimes local things just happen and it's just what the church does. 
Doesn't have to be legislated. Okay. Um, also, in the sixth century, uh, Christianity really began to focus more on more on art with Christian topics. <coughs> Um, kind of corresponding with that, pagan art uh, began to recede. And mosaic art began to appear, mosaic Christian art, which was a carryover from uh, <coughs> an ancient Roman technique, and that's basically using stones. Someday we may have <laughs> an example of mosaic art in St. George. Hopefully. We get the donors. Um, around 525 was born uh, John Climacus. He lived till 606. Um, he was in the east, um, and he became a monk on Mount Sinai uh, at age 16. This was a monastery that would later be uh, rebuilt, but it's a very famous monastery. He lived then as a hermit for 20 years. And then he wrote a book called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. It's, uh, for me, it was a difficult book. <laughs> it's a book um, describing the monastic life. Um, it's divided into 30 chapters, which he describes as rungs on a ladder ascending to God. Uh, each rung being something that <clears throat> that you step up onto and then learn of it and overcome it. And oftentimes slip off of the ladder and go around and start again. And um, this is an icon of the ladder of divine ascent. representing that, that process. What, what was the name of the paper that Addison and Steele published in England? I can't think of it. I, I normally know it. They were like uh, around the time of Dickens. <coughs> and, Addison, as I recall, published an essay in, in that paper after having gone to Persia uh, describing a, well, the title of it was The Vision at Mirza. And um, what he described, not in any Orthodox Christian context, is that. This book uh, quickly became a really beloved Christian book, and it's one of the most widely read uh, among Orthodox Christians today. I checked, and I don't find a copy of it in the library, but we either have it or should have it. <laughs> It 
be prepared for some real challenges if you choose to read it. This feast day is on March the 30th, <clears throat> and you may all be aware already that um, he is celebrated on the fourth Sunday of Lent. An important individual in the history of the church. Another important and certainly interesting individual in the history of the church is Emperor Justinian the Great, who uh, ruled uh, as emperor from 527 to 565. He was a Macedonian. And um, an emperor before him, Emperor Justin, was his uncle. And Emperor Justin took responsibility for Justinian's development, education, or whatnot. And uh, Justinian eventually succeeded him. Um, you will see, as we go through some of the things that he did, <clears throat> that he was probably probably the most hands-on emperor um, in the history of the church or the empire. I'm sure uh, that that was a characteristic that was pleasing to some and exasperating to many, I would imagine. He was known as the emperor who never sleeps. And his wife, uh, he and his wife Theodora, were very committed to unifying the empire. That is, really, to reunifying the empire and to reuniting the Orthodox and the Monophysites. In the case of that latter, uh, of course, they failed. He was, um, maybe some would call him, a really good manager. He surrounded himself with highly talented people and experienced people um, based upon merit and not on the typical aristocratic origin. <coughs> and that helped him get lots of things done. He considered it his divine duty to restore the empire to its ancient boundaries. And he believed that that unity of the empire presupposed the unity of the faith, which for him must be Nicene Orthodoxy. One of the very um, qualified and successful appointees was General Belisarius, who defeated several Germanic tribes and retook Rome. Just to digress or go on a rabbit trail a little bit, <clears throat> the Council of Orange 
affirmed the Augustinian doctrine of original sin, saying that the descendants of Adam need God's grace to even obtain the beginning of faith, and that fallen man is not capable of any good work deserving of salvation. Several sessions ago, when we dwelt for a little bit on Augustine, uh, there was some considerable discussion, if you recall. And um, Father pointed out that he was, or is, a pillar of the Western Church. And that uh, this doctrine of original sin um, and our involvement in it is different than the perspective in the Orthodox Church. And this action really um, put him in that place historically. Where is Where did this happen? Where is Orange at? I don't know. But, but this is a Western local council. It's a, it's a Western local council. I think it might be in France, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it was a Western local council. So this really happens without the knowledge of the Orthodox East. They don't know this happens. Or, or, or even Emperor Justinian. Right. In 532... You recall that Emperor Justinian and his advisor wife Theodora really wanted to reunify the Chalcedonians and, non, or, and the Monophysites. And the Monophysites' <coughs> um, leadership hoped for that too, although from a little bit different perspective. Each party kind of wanted the other one to come over to their side. And so, in 532, the Monophysite leaders wrote a letter to Justinian, and this is what it said, quote, Thus shall peace prevail in your reign by the power of the high hand of God the Almighty, to whom we pray on your behalf, that without toil or struggle in arms, he will set your enemies as a footstool beneath your feet, unquote. They were hoping to garner his support from monophysitism. It didn't work. If we go back to 483, the Vandals had invaded North Africa. The king was Huneric. And I didn't mention it, but he ordered, he was uh, Arian, or supposedly Arian. <clears throat> Although they persecuted lots of Christians in general. But he ordered that there be a debate in Carthage in 483 between the Arians and the Orthodox, or the non-Arians, the bishops. And he presided. I believe it was about three days long, and at the end he declared that the Orthodox lost and placed Arians in positions of authority and really increased um, persecution of the Orthodox and the Christians. The Vandals were terrible. Well. And I, and I pointed out last time that that's where our word vandalism or vandal comes from. And maybe our word hun comes from King Huneric. I don't know. But in 534, Justinian sent General Beryl Osarius to North Africa, and the vandal, vandals down there were essentially destroyed. Uh, 
the churches were reinstated. Justinian was very interested in laws and in a legal system. And in 536, he published a code of laws for the empire, which basically forms the foundation of the legal systems in many nations today, particularly the United States, Great Britain, um, some of the, the European countries. A very lasting uh, set of concepts, personally published by him. In 537, he completed the rebuilding of Hagia Sophia, which was the main church in Constantinople. It had burned in earlier years. And um, it was magnificent. I guess it was magnificent before, but particularly when he finished it. When he finished it, he was noted as saying, O Solomon, I have surpassed thee. <laughs> In 542, he commissioned John of Ephesus to convert all pagans remaining in Asia Minor by force, if necessary. He didn't mess around. <laughs> During this time, there was the revival of Oregonistic theology. Uh, particularly through the preaching and writing of someone we mentioned before, uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia and two other people about, you've probably never heard their names. So organism was, was rising in um, influence due to these people and so in 543, Emperor Justinian published a document which is really known, the title of which is really known as the Three Chapters. But I'm, I've, I've read and I'm told that a more correct translation of that title is the Three Heads. And the three heads being Theodore of Mopsuestius and the other two uh, bishops who were supporting the development of this or continuation of organistic um, theology. So he published this document against those three people, against this organism, and also against Nestorianism. At this point, a pope in Rome, Vigilius, thought that um, Justinian should call for another ecumenical council. And in response, <coughs> uh, he, he published then another document called Confession of Faith, uh, affirming the authority of the, four, of the first four ecumenical councils. What a man. In 550, he prohibited the elevation of married bishops, and he restricted the episcopate, the episcopate to, to, to people becoming bishops to either unmarried or widowed priests or monks. 
and that's as it is today. Then in 553, in fact, he called for the Fifth Ecumenical Council. So let's go over to that. It was uh, in May and June of 553, and it was in Constantinople, so this would be the second ecumenical council that was in, held in Constantinople. It was attended by the patriarchs of Antioch and Alexandria and Constantinople. And the patriarch from Jerusalem sent a delegate. Pope Vigilius of Rome refused to attend because he believed that there was not enough representation from the Western churches. So, the Fifth Ecumenical Council deposed Pope Vigilius. Six months later, he agreed with the decision of the Ecumenical Council. I guess he wanted his job back. Justin's document, the three heads, or the three chapters, was adopted. The authority of the first four councils were affirmed. Cyril's theology was affirmed again. Cyril of Alexandria. And there were 12 anathemas against Nestorius that were read and adopted. And against Nestorianism. And they affirmed that there are two natures of Christ understood as two attributes in a single person. The hope was that by, by virtue of this being adopted, that the Monophysites would come back. I'm not sure why one would hope that. <laughs> Those decisions were accepted throughout the Chalcedonian East. Justinian began exiling non-Chalcedonian <clears throat> bishops. The Monophysites rejected the council and the schism between Monophysitism and Orthodoxy became permanent. But, as each side hoped for conversion of the other, and that's kind of basically where everybody's position was, a schism developed between the Syrian and Egyptian Monophysites almost immediately. So the Monophysites lost control of Egypt and Alexandria until the Muslim conquest of 646. Chalcedonian clergy were reinstated in these areas. Back to Justinian. In 554, through the efforts of his general Belisarius, he restored Roman rule in Italy. Remember, the Visigoths had kind of taken over. And he had bishops begin supervising civil, educational, and financial systems in the Roman society. 
more responsibilities, of course. By 554, that same year, uh, plague had reduced the empire's population by one third. Things were not good for the populace. And so the Roman church had to really begin to concentrate on supplying food to people who didn't have it, and to the army. And we'll get back to that. In 557, Justinian completed the rebuilding of this monastery uh, on Mount Sinai where St. John Climacus was, had been. It, it's a monastery, it was and is a monastery that's on the site of where God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and he renamed it St. Catherine's Monastery. In 563, he established a mission in northern Scotland, um, Iona, in fact, under Patrick. And at the same time, um, the empire abandoned Hadrian's Wall across Great Britain uh, to the Angles and Saxons. If you recall, this was a, literally a wall that was all the way across kind of the middle of Great Britain uh, that the Roman Empire constructed at its northern edge, uh, at its farthest, um, to keep out all the Huns. And, and in fact, that wall uh, continued across Europe uh, through Germany. Things didn't last long because in 568 the Lombards invaded and took Italy. Interesting names. Um, There had been a Visigothic king named Hermenegild who wanted to, um, and you recall that they had come down and invaded um, Italy in particular, um, and Hermenegild, King Hermenegild wanted to uh, reinstate um, uh, Visigothic pagan religion. Um, but you also recall that through the effect of missionaries, principally Western missionaries, uh, the Visigoths were slowly becoming uh, Aryan Christians. And King Hermenegild's son, Leovigild, converted to Christianity and Hermenegild had him executed. When Hermenegild died shortly before this, then Leovigild's son, Ricard, became king. And in 589, and he was Nicene, not Arian, but there was this Nicene-Arian conflict among the Visigoths. And in 589, at the Council of Toledo, 
King Ricard, Ricard, in an oration, inserted the filioque into the creed. to strengthen or affirm the equality of Christ, the Logos, as a move against the Arians. But I believe this is the first known instance of the application of the filioque to the Nicene Creed and that became a major issue between the Roman Church of the West and the Orthodox Church. It also became a tool with which Charlemagne um, challenged the Eastern Church. We talked about food and famine because of all this conflict. Um, there was, at this time, um, or certainly after the Julius, um, one Gregory who was um, born into, I guess, what you could call the upper crust or the aristocracy in Rome. around 540, such that um, he became the governor of Rome. In 573, he resigned as governor and turned his um, home, which had been the home of his parents, uh, into a monastery. Six years later, he was ordained a deacon and became Rome's ambassador to Constantinople for a period of seven years. He returned after that seven years and in 590 very reluctantly accepted the papacy. It's notable that he was the first monk to become the Bishop of Rome. Um, kind of reminds me of St. John Chrysostom in the East. But he did a lot to strengthen the clergy and the churches to um, rebuild up the morality of the clergy and, and the church. And he very much from the beginning emphasized mercy to the sick and the poor, whom we realize by now were pretty much everywhere around him. To the extent that he frequently cooked for the poor, and had his staff bring indigent people in for, for meals. And he was known to refuse to eat at those meals if there were less than 12 indigents brought in. Humility. He said, quote, anyone aspiring to be a universal bishop is playing the role of the Antichrist, unquote. <clears throat> Doesn't sound like a statement from a man with a large ego. The, do you get into any of the other quotations about that? Um, or that, the, one in the, readings. the controversy. 
just just can I take just a sure. two minutes to to explain what's going on? Um, the patriarch of Constantinople at that time, or the the bishop, uh, the, the patriarch. Uh, that's the first time that the title ecumenical right. is taken up by the con by by the patriarch of Constantinople. And the ecumene, the ecumene is the world, is the ecumenical. So, so he becomes the ecumenical patriarch. And the ecumenical patriarch, I don't know if it's, is it John the Faster? Uh, it, it, it's someone who is very humble, very uh, to the poor, very giving to the poor, very ascetical. Um, and there's an article you can read about, um, you know, Constantinople is really kind of considered the center of the empire and ecumenical was a title, an honorific title given, not just to the patriarch of Constantinople, the actual the librarian of the Library of Constantinople was given the title ecumenical librarian. But it did not mean that, and ecumenical means universal, but it did not mean that he was a librarian in charge of all the other librarians across the empire and could tell them what to do. It was just a honorific title, kind of fluff, well, given to people. And maybe kind of a background is at this point in time, uh -huh. Constantinople was really into conferring titles. Yes, very so, big into titles and honors and accolades and all this stuff. So this title is assumed by and still has, maybe it's taken on a different meaning in the minds of some today. But the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople carries this title from this time. But it did not mean in the mind of the ecumenical patriarch or the ecumenical librarian or the ecumenical street sweeper that they were in charge of other people. It just meant that they were the street sweeper or the librarian or the bishop of the star city, the capital city of the world, of the universe, the, of the ecumene. But... St. Gregory hears about this, and it's very interesting because if you want really uh, to look at what the, he thought at the time, which may be representative of the Western Christian tradition, about the idea of there being a bishop above all the other bishops, he writes several letters, and there are great, great quotes in them. I have heard, not extensively, that... Uh, some Roman Catholic apologists will say, well, see, he's defending the papacy, he's defending the, the seat of Rome. But if you really read them and understand what's going on, it's very clear, like this, is very clear. He, he talks uh, about this. There's some quotes in, uh, in the pamphlet upstairs, What is the Church? Uh, and really, um, I, again, I haven't heard deeply the Roman Catholic arguments that try and explain statements like this and kind of reverse engineer him to be saying this to support the papacy when he's very obviously undercutting any idea of a bishop over other bishops. I haven't heard their arguments and justifications, but if you read his statements, and there's several of them, there's uh, one, there's one in the readings. that very uh, clear about what he's saying and about what the Pope, what I would say, I'm going to answer your question, the greatest... Pope of Rome ever thought about the episcopacy and about his own position. I would imagine because of his experience of being the ambassador to Constantinople. <coughs> He was able to really improve relationships between Constantinople or the Byzantine Empire and Rome. And he also, um, we mentioned that he started a mission in Iona, in northern Scotland. He also improved the relationship with the Angles and the Saxons, which soon will become obvious and important. He was the first pope to use, quote, servant of the servants of God, 
as a papal title. <coughs> he is credited with compiling the liturgy of the presanctified gifts. Which we use every Wednesday and Friday still during Lent, yeah. but is not used in the Latin church. How come they probably don't know why why don't they do it? I don't know. It really it was it was a practice in Rome that during Lent, during the weekdays, they would not have the consecration of the Eucharist. So they would have the Eucharist like we do. No, like we do during Lent, consecrated on Sunday, and then just save a portion of that and distribute it during the pre-sanctified liturgies through the weekdays. So they did do it for a while, but it, it's fallen it's fallen away, and I don't know when it fell away, but we still have it. It's, it's one of our main Lenten services. Some people also uh, credit him with the development of what's called Gregorian chant. But that's probably not the case. Uh, haven't been developed by others later. So in 597, through his efforts, King Oswe of England placed England under Roman obedience. And that stuck until Henry VIII. Yeah. 